This is a GK Media Podcast. Henry Woodman, a tech entrepreneur, angel investor, board member, business coach, executive producer, traveler, golfer. I won't say the word before. That. No, no, I can say it. Shitty golfer. Your own handicap. Shitty golfer. <laughs> yeah. Handicap would be a nice thing if they said that. Um, but more so, a man who has not given up on following his lifelong dream. Henry Woodman, thank you so much for joining me today on Gary Talks. Thank you, Gary. It's great to be here. I was looking through all the great stuff that you've worked on over the years. Very, very jealous because I love to travel. It's one of my, one of my core values in life is adventure and travel and discovery. And I saw that you've gotten to just travel in so many places and create work out of it, create business out of it. Uh, and that has opened up the door and led you on to other areas. But talk to me about getting involved in tra travel. Did you always have that kind of, that bug to get, get on an airplane and go off an adventure? Yeah, I, you know, I think it was in large part because my dad was in the travel business, which of course, facilitated the ease of being able to travel. And so since I was, I don't even remember when I got my first passport, but I was a baby. So I was traveling around a lot when I was younger. So it's kind of been ingrained in my life. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what were some of the most fascinating places that you've visited over the years? Well, I guess it would depend in large part what we consider fascinating. So from Early on, when I was a 16-year-old kid, I was in the jungles of Honduras looking for a lost city. I thought, you know, I was either going to die or I was going, me and my teenage friends were going to plot to kill, this is a true story, the guy because we thought he was going to kill us. So it was one of those Lord of the Fly moments where you thought, how the hell did I even get here? And, you know, my dad had convinced me that this great adventure lie in the jungles of Honduras where we will search for this lost city. And we were, you know, enamored with the idea of the adventure without much concept of the suffering that was involved. <laughs> so we, we learned a lot there. We never, we, we probably walked on top of this lost city cause we never found it cause it was okay. pretty much swallowed up by the jungle. And literally decades later with the invention of LIDAR, they did find these ruins underneath those jungle canopies in the Mosquito Coast in Honduras. Wow. So was your dad a sort of an, an, an alternative Indiana Jones? He was. He was, a, he was a definite explorer. He was also the president of the International Explorer Society, and he was fascinated with the archaeological ruins and focused a lot on Latin America. So you got to produce a number of travel shows and work for the likes of American Airlines, American Express, Eastern Airlines, International Cruises. It sounds like a dream job, but was it? <laughs> well, it, the, you know, the, the reality was it kind of emanated from Honduras when, um, when we finished and we found some ruins. We didn't find the city, obviously. Uh, they sent a, a film crew from ABC Sportsman, which is a network here in the U.S., and uh, I thought, that is the coolest thing ever. This guy who was the director was 24 years old. I was 16 at the time. And I thought to myself, he's traveling around the world. He's got a fun job. He's not at a desk. And I, this is what I want to do, right? Mm. And so I focused my attentions to think, you know what? When I graduate, I want to get into film and television. Um, of course, that did not happen. Uh, I ended up I mean, literally like film and television for LA and Hollywood, I ended up on a travel film as a PA, which is a production assistant thing, a kind of gopher that does anything. And eventually, you know, moved my way through the ranks to, you know, sound guy, assistant director, eventually producing travel films. So after a decade of doing a lot of traveling, producing travel is fun. But then, you know, after a while you figure, geez, it's been nine months since I've seen more than one week in any particular country. So you got to mm -hmm. kind of settle down and wish for your own bed. Now, when you're younger, which I was, a lot easier to do. You're not as spoiled and pretentious about where you stay. You can stay up late and get drunk and wake up the next morning and you're still able to work. Uh, not 
<laughs> and I see early on, like pretty much at the when it started, even before it became a thing, you got into like virtual reality 360, yeah. which again is even like 2024, like 25 plus years later, that's still something that the powers that be like Mesh are even trying to, you, you know, take hold of and. Yeah, it, it's, you know, when, when you look back on life, much like what Steve Jobs says, and you're connecting the dots. So I look back and I'm thinking, okay, so I'm doing these travel films while that's happening. You know, one of the places we were filming in Chile, in Latin America, it went from a dictatorship to a democracy. And as a result, they added new television stations and a new network. So they needed content, right? And I thought, you know what? I'm tired of traveling, as I mentioned. I, I want to sit settle down for a little bit. There is an opportunity. I can pitch myself as an American producer and I got this idea. I ripped off an idea from a game show in the US. I went down there. I produced a show in Chile called Machos. So fast forward and eventually they introduced nonlinear editing systems, which at the time was like, wow, mind blown, right? Yeah. And then somebody walks in and gives me a CD-ROM that I put in the computer and I can do a 360 degree up, down, all around view of a dope, of a destination. I'm like, wow, that's so cool, right? Which led to the virtual tour thing. I thought, you know what? I don't have to travel with five guys and 17 pieces of luggage to do travel films. I can just get one camera. I bought the world's second one shot camera and I can travel mm -hmm. around and do my own thing and shoot virtual tours for hotels and destiny. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Right. So then I found a, you know, a company called world travel vision. And the idea was simple. We would travel to your location. We would shoot 360 tours. We'd give you a CD ROM and you take it to the trade shows and the conferences to promote your destination or your hotel. Right. And as, as it luck would have it, you know, we would do this and eventually these hoteliers would say, how do we get these virtual tours on this new world wide web thingy? I'm like, I don't know, send them a CD-ROM. What do I know about technology? Right. And they said, yeah, we do. And, and there's no standard and they don't know what to do with it. And I'm like, okay, well, let me see what I can do to help. And of course, one thing led to another. And if, if you look back and you say, okay, as a kid with a camera and a computer, Where's the barrier to entry? Eh, it's not really a big moat there. So the real value isn't in the production of content, but in the distribution of content. So we decide to help the hotels. I, I decide to convert uh, pivot, if you will, from a production company to a distribution company. But along the way, we produce your content at a really cheap price so that we could then distribute it to the travel sites. Right. And eventually we realize, well, the virtual tours are nice to have, but the need to have component are the pictures. And early on, pictures were not that accessible because those reservation systems, they called them the GDSs, they had the rate and the availability. They didn't have the capacity or the bandwidth for photos. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, so here's an opportunity, right? marry the photos with them, get them collected, sized, tagged, categorized, and distributed everywhere, right? Not an easy task, of course, uh, but that was essentially where we, I want to say, pivoted and evolved the business from a production company to a tech platform. So now, 25, 30 years later, you go on to any travel website, booking, Expedia, PIP is travel, doesn't matter. You see pictures of a hotel that generally would have come from our servers. Of course, I sold that business a few years ago. Yay! <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. There's like a lot of changes there. I think for anyone born in the last 20 years, it just seems like Stone Age type language of what we had to do. But yeah, it all makes sense. Like I remember myself, the early days of learning how to design websites, all that coding, like nothing was simple, even to upload a photo, nothing. No. Nothing was simple. And it took ages there's yeah. no sh shortcuts, no, no AI, no chat GBT, nothing. <laughs> and what about, and, and, go on. I was going to say, and the costs have come way down. I mean, when we would store images, they, they were expensive. Now, easy peasy, and you're right, AI, and, and you know, I, I, I still can't write a line of code. So I'm impressed that AI can do things for you. And 
it's obvious that you had your finger on the pulse in terms of technology and innovation going back over the last 30 years. Just mentioning AI, what way do you see technology and the world we live in going? Wow. You know, I, I you know, people will say, wow, you were there and, and you innovated. I, I don't think I innovated much. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and stumble on the right, you know, sort of idea for that time. And, and even if it wasn't, you know, I change and pivot. But the answer would, in my opinion, be that I think technology is probably going to make things a lot easier and the barrier to entry lower, which creates another problem right? Because mm-hmm. if everybody, if the playing field is leveled, then who's left, right? You know, there was a time where great developers were expensive as hell, right? Now a good developer with proper AI can be a great developer, right? Yeah. With the QA, the, you know, the quality assurance and all of the things that you have to make you good. So I think that it's going to level the playing field, but it's also going to produce a lot of noise. You know, there's just going to be a lot of stuff, just, just like the, the digital marketing world. It's like, how do you separate what's good and what's not with all of the stuff that's presented? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even, you know, one of the key things years ago with digital marketing was bombardment because there's so much noise out there. You need to keep bombarding people with information to grab their attention. Whereas I can see now, especially the likes of Meta, what they're doing is they're changing their algorithms more and more to kind of get rid of the heavy noise because people otherwise are just leaving the their platforms. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're correct. It's a fine line between bombarding and me getting sick and tired of this one thing over and over again. And I'm like, that's it. Unsubscribe, get out. Or I, yeah. I delete it. Right. Yeah. And the fact that you're going to do it just enough to where you haven't really upset me, right? It's a very, very fine line. And do it just enough to where you find that I'm interested somewhat as opposed to I'm annoyed, right? Or I stand out because you're in a world of noise. And how do you separate good from bad or, you know, quality from not quality? That's a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So you sold your company, you made a few quid. Just a few. (laughs) What did you get into then? So, you know, as as I was building, first of all, I had no idea what I was doing early on. I ended up um, learning on the way, which, you know, when people say, you know, go back and, and, you know, learn it in school. Yeah, you kind of learn the hard knocks. You know, you find the issues and the hurdles, you overcome them, you try to figure out, all right, how do I avoid that again? So we grow, we grow, we grow. We always had uh, told the employees that, you know, one day we intend to sell the company. I mean, let's be clear. It is a technology company. Things change. Who knows what's going to happen in a couple of decades, right? So um, along the way, several companies would approach us and say, you know, you guys have been growing pretty quickly. We're we're very interested. And I'm saying, I'm always interested, right? there was a number on my mirror for a decade, right? Because early on, I was, I had mortgaged my house, took a line of credit just to pay the employees. We were, we were struggling. And so people would approach us and I would say, yeah, but you know, I don't think I'm ready yet, but I'm, I'm ready to listen because I think I need to be at this revenue to get this multiplier because, you know, this is my number. Right. And so finally, you know, they said, well, what are you looking for? And I, I gave the number, right. They said, no. And so a month later, they call me up and this is a multi-billion dollar international company and they fly in the CFO and the COO and they say, okay, this is what we're interested in. Here are the numbers. Here's why. Here's the rationale. And I looked at him and I said, listen, guys, I'm going to be clear. I'm making good money. I don't have a boss. I don't have a board. I sleep well at night and I don't have any debt. Why would I sell the company unless I get to my number? And I mean, you will overpay today for something you'll underpay for tomorrow. Now, I really believe that. And I shut up. And they looked at each other. It was probably 10 seconds, but it felt like minutes. And then the COO finally looked at me and goes, fine, you got a deal. 
Wow. And no investment banker, the in, the the uh, attorneys got a hold, put an agreement together. 60 days later, money was in the bank. And keep in mind, this is a technology for hospitality. This was one year before COVID, right? So every major company in the world, you know, the Wyndhams and the Hiltons and the Hyatts of the world all had entire revenue stream dry up. Not just, you know, a couple of hotels or a country, the planet Earth, no more revenue for Hilton, no more revenue for these guys. And they were hurting. So did I get out on time? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Uh, what's the tax like uh, in America then when you sell a business? Yeah, the tax, if you're the owner, if you're active in the business as yeah. opposed to an investor and you have a um, equity, you know, and you've had it for more than a couple of years, I think it is, uh, it's 24 and a half percent it was at the time. So, you know, let's just say 25%. Yeah. yeah. And is there is there relief for the first couple of million or anything? No. <laughs> I mean, what do you mean relief for the first couple So I know in Ireland you get entrepreneurial relief. So you you don't pay tax on the first million and after that million you do get taxed. And in the UK it's something like 10 million before you get taxed. Yeah, there is, it, it depends on how you set up the corporate structure. I know now what I didn't know then, but if I had set it up as a C corporation before the sale and had it, I think two years or something before the sale, then I could have avoided $10 million of that, the first $10 million in taxes, right? Because I was an S corporation, you know, more of a sole proprietor, if you will, I didn't know, nor did I even give it any consideration. And I, I, was, I don't think I was smart enough to sit down with the accountants and say, listen, this is when I think I'm going to sell. Let's prepare now. Yeah. I, I honestly believed I had a few more years of runway. And when the the number came in and what I wanted, it was a 20 times EBITDA, I might add. So I didn't expect that. And when it was given, I'm like, fine, bring it on. Yeah. Okay. I'm there. So the tax was less of a concern because it came so quickly. And I thought, you know, I had time, but I didn't. <laughs> well, you're obviously a good negotiator to get a sale turned around and money and the gang within 60 days. Now, this is, this is an important part. It's not the matter of a good negotiator. It's a matter of being in a position of strength, right? Mm -hmm. Had I had, you know, we had one competitor, right? And we were starting to steamroll them. And it was a matter of decisions made years earlier. But what ends up happening is if you have good, you know, revenue and you have, and this was a technology SaaS company. So once hotel groups integrate with our platform, it's really hard to leave. You're kind of married, you know, and it's an ongoing revenue stream. So that's not going to change. And the world was expanding with the likes of vacation rentals, you know, the Airbnbs and the VRBOs of the world. So there was tremendous opportunity to scale, right? And so when you're negotiating from a position of strength, and in my case, I think it was in addition to strength that might have been a little arrogance, right? Because I didn't know what I didn't know. I think you have a better opportunity to stand firm with what you're looking for. Because if you're not, and you see these dollar bills in your mind, and you're like, oh my God, I'll take anything, I'll drop my mm -hmm. pants, whatever, then you just might. So going from someone who had to remortgage their house and get credit to pay the staff to now having money beyond their wildest dreams. How does that change you as a person? I think I became a, a shittier golfer. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny is I don't know that it changed me much more than it made me appreciate some of the things and look back and say, why did I stress so much? You know, I mean, I was more worried about the, you know, the, the things that really weren't that worrisome. I, they were at the time. I thought the world was coming to an end. Um, paradoxically, I, I, I think of it like the difference between drowning and treading water and I'm a swimmer. So, you know, I'm comfortable just laying there calmly treading mm -hmm. water. But when you get thrown in the pool and you don't know how to swim, you're moving your arms, flailing around and panicking and breathing. And mentally you're just expending all kinds of energy when you can't tell somebody, by the way, in order to survive, just tread water nice and easy like this, relax your mind, 
And that's the same with business. You can't just say, listen, here are the things you should do. You need to position this, structure that, get your KPIs, have your vision, have your culture. Like, ah, but I have bills to pay. There's clients that don't give me the, you know, and you're panicking and you think the world's coming to an end. So the long answer to the question is obviously there's a lot more comfort, you know, comfort level. I sleep much better at night. I don't stress about things. And, you know, I can continue doing other things that I have a passion for, you know, traveling and then, you know, the next chapter in my life, as it were. Um, And I'm coaching small businesses simply because I want to help them learn one, a lot of the things and the mistakes that I made and try to avoid that themselves. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, It's always really, really important to give back. And I suppose even little things like traveling now, because it's, you're not doing it for work. It's a different experience. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I I was always somewhat of a hedonist. So if I had to travel somewhere, whether it was to meet a client or a conference or something, I would generally try to take extra time and make it into a travel vacation thing and bring my wife and daughter if I could. So it wasn't like, I, uh, you know, cause especially the international trips, it was always like, okay, so I'm going here for this conference and we're going to stay an extra week and, you know, explore it. And, yeah. you know, because it was my little small business, it was always, oh, the business will pay for my travel. So that's cool. I get that out of the way. So there was a savings, you know, there as well. Yeah. And it's given you the opportunity now to do something that's always been a lifelong dream and that is to make a movie or make a TV show. Talk to me about the reincarnation of Marie. So, you know, as I mentioned, when I graduated college, I moved to Los Angeles with ideas of, of producing and directing movies. And of course that didn't happen while I was there. My father, who was a, a, an author, uh, but not a, a, non he was a not a fiction love romance author by the stretch of anybody's imagination and so he wrote a tribute to a friend he's moving my sister sees it she asks him he explains she reads it she says oh my god this was amazing she calls me up she goes i know you're in la doing trying to get into the movie business you should read this it would make a great movie so my sister sends me you know this this manuscript and i fall in love i i was like oh my god this is amazing dad, I'd love to, can I buy this? I don't have any money. I'll give you a buck. Right. So we, we, he said he essentially wasn't planning on publishing it per se. He just wanted to do it as a tribute. And so here I'm sitting on this, this story and I think how nepotistic it's my dad that wrote it. Right. So I, I call a friend of mine who I knew was producing a movie at the time. And I ask him if he can read it just to give me his thoughts. And of course, he's in the middle of producing a movie. He says, Henry, I don't have the time, but you know, I'll get to it. I said, no rush. Three days later, he calls me up. He says, this is amazing. We are meant to do this. I'm like, let's do it. Anyway, he gets um, a, a raw deal with the distribution company. He's upset with the industry. He goes into real estate. I go to Latin America to produce game shows. Make a long story short, fast forward four years. I say, you know, when I sell my tech company, we're going to do this. And so... The first step was to publish the book, which we just did a couple of weeks ago. And then from the book, we springboard that concept into a TV series for streaming. Now, the idea is simple is, is this guy falls in love and finds his soulmate. Oh, yeah. So the only problem is tell us the story there. Yeah. Yeah. Guy falls in love. You know, he finds his soulmate, but there's only one problem. She dies a hundred years. She died a hundred years ago right? And he read this journal. This is based on an actual woman named Marie Barsh-Kerstaff. And Marie wrote a journal between 14 and 24, that's when she died, in the late 1800s. And after her death, the journal was published and it became an international bestseller. And so a hundred years later, the guy picks up the journal, he reads about this woman, he's falling in love with her words. And then he finds that he's in love with this woman that, oh my God, She's writing about finding me in time and in the future and where I'm meant to be and who am I? Oh, she's writing to me. So he dilutes himself and believes, oh my God, she's writing to me. And then he finally realizes, that's just crazy. I've fallen in love with a woman who is dead. Uh, Then he finds her reincarnation. 
It's kind of the basis of the story. Now, the series goes far deeper into exploring the lives of you know, him in his current life and then her and her past life and how those different lives intersect and the other people and sort of the, the aspects of karma. I mean, are we, are we paying for karma things we did good or bad in the past, you know, and do soulmates exist or is this all a figment of our imagination or are we slipping through different metaverses? We don't yeah. obviously answer these questions because God knows who knows. But we pose that as these are possibilities, right? It's a strange and spooky world out there. Yeah, no, it's it's class. I love the story, um, yeah. and it and it, it's all you know, a TV series or a movie that has you walking away asking deeper questions. Uh, I I think it's such a rich experience to get from it. So, it, it, uh, sorry, Gary, and it's really sort of the question is. First of all, is there such a thing as a soulmate? You know, when we find somebody, is it is it, is this a soulmate or are we just passionate about sex or something, right? Mm. And then if it is a soulmate and we hear these stories, love, hate, being two sides of the same coin, then does that mean that, you know, we have some karmatic retribution to pay off that we did something in a prior life or did we pass and then leave? Because we always end up saying, does love transcend time? Will I find them in another life? Did I miss them? Did we pass like two ships in the night? And these are some really great questions. If you look at the universe and you say, look, we're a tiny, teeny speck on a grain of sand in a huge, massive ocean of you know the universe, right? So why do we feel we're so special? Is it somewhere in time in this little speck? I mean, when we look at the existence of our own planet, and then the time that we as humans have been on it, we're like a blade of grass at the end of a football field. That's it, right? Yeah. How insignificant, right? It's hard to put that into perspective. It's funny though, because there's been times that I might have just briefly met someone or passed someone on the street, and I have this feeling of, like, I feel I know them from another time, another life. Do you know, there's, it's very strange, but you feel you deeply know someone but yet, as things presently stand, you don't know this person at all. Right. Uh, and there may be that connection. I mean, uh, when, when our, our protagonist in the book, um, he reads about Marie's life and he feels like she's writing to him. And, you know, in the series, she has a pen pal relationship with a famous writer called Guy Montpassant. This is, this is true, the, the historical part. And in our series, we find that he is the reincarnation of Marie because she has this pen pal relationship as anonymous. He doesn't know who she is. They have this ongoing letter relationship. And we explore those things deeper to say, were they there in the past? Did they know each other somehow? Did they see each other? Did they connect? Or were they just passing ships in the night and then they connected in another life? You know, we have a lot of spooky things like DNA effects yeah. of people from certain traumas affecting grandchildren yeah, yeah, yeah. right yeah. so there's something going on here absolutely so the good thing is you're not under pressure to get this off the ground in the sense that you know you have the mortgage covered and all that so it does give you that sense of strength as well that you don't have to go in and negotiate on weak deals whatever puts you in a better position but it is it's a it is a, a, a mountain to climb now, isn't it? To get this. Sure. To get this up and running. Yeah, this is, this is obviously an area that I don't know well. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking to other, you know, showrunners and producers and many of them do well, but you know, they haven't knocked it out of the park and, you know, had what, what we here call F you money. Right. And they say, man, you did it right. You built a tech company. Now you go back to your passions. Right. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it really is a matter of I'm not desperate to sell anything or I have to do this to pay the mortgage. It's something that, pun intended, you know, I'm going to close the next chapter of my life, which was a passion 40 years ago and that I have the ability to do without having a lot of stress. Now, it will happen one way or another. When and how is dependent on the industry. You know, it's a, it's a very funky industry with respect to how things get done, who you know. It's just like business, right? 
It's surrounding yourself with people who are in the know. Yeah. And then yeah. there's obviously networking and talking to people and somebody sees the book or hears about it and says, wow, that's a great concept. I think it would make a, you know, there's a niche out there that would love this kind of stuff, right? And then how it's produced well enough to get to an audience is the, is the challenge. Because anybody with an iPhone and a computer could pretty much produce content, right? You got to get to the right quality, the, the writing and the acting and, and the lighting and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just, we were saying, I think before we started recording, it was different years ago when it was just the studios, a handful of studios that controlled the industry. Whereas now, you know, with Disney, Paramount Plus, Apple, Netflix, it's opened up the market globally. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you know, 40 years ago, the studios controlled a lot of what was, you know, being done and distributed, right? The production and the distribution. Now it's more in the hands of the distribution channels, the Netflixes and the Amazons of the world. They also have production arms, but more than not, they're buying content from other producers and production companies. So the large studios don't have the same grip. Movies are not as prevalent. I mean, they're huge, obviously, but you know, there was a time where if I wanted to get my dose of entertainment, I would go with my friends. We didn't have a lot of money, so we'd sneak into a movie theater or pay for one and watch three, if you will. And we would watch movies on a big screen. Now, hey, it's hard pressed for me to get out of the house with, you know, large TV and streaming access uh, and good sound systems to have to go to a movie theater where, you know, I got to wait and I got to watch a lot of, you know, previews and there's people making noise on their phone and stuff. Why? Right. Wait a couple of months. It'll be on TV. Yeah. My problem with trying to watch a movie at home on TV is I'm dual watching. I have the phone on. You know, I'm going making a cup of tea or opening a bottle of wine. Like it, there's at least the one beauty I like about the cinema is you're just you're more in the zone. If it's a, if it's quiet, if it's not on a, that's a good point. You know, it, it, I think go to a comedy or a scary movie with the auditorium packed is great. But otherwise, if you just want to watch a good drama or something, go in early in the morning when the zone around. It, it yeah, that's a, that's impactful. a good point. And now that you th that you mention that, it is funny because. <clears throat> I think some of the challenges with content production these days is you're competing with people that are at a screen watching a movie part time because they're also looking at their phone or they're distracted with other things that are going on. So it almost means you have to make sure that you're engaging enough to keep their attention all the time or most of the time, as opposed to long drawn out scenes that, you know, I, I can look down and check my phone and I won't lose anything. Yeah. You know, especially the series that, that we're producing, it's laying a lot of pieces of the puzzle out. So there's a lot going on in the first, you know, in the first few shows that you're like, wow, how are all these things connected where they slowly start to connect in the end? And you realize how all of this is connected, right? It's like taking a jigsaw puzzle, tossing all the pieces out there and you have no idea what's going on, except you kind of see what the box is supposed to look like. And then you start putting the pieces out on the corners and then you start to get a clear picture of where things go. That's kind of what we're doing with this series. And it's like life, you know, you, you're going through life aimlessly trying to figure out what it's all about. And, you know, eventually I don't know that you die and you figure it out, but I think eventually you kind of come to a, okay, I'm accepting if you will, you know? Well, you're currently an Emmy nominated TV producer and editor Hopefully, I'll be saying award-winning yeah, yeah, producer. Well, I have to say the, the Emmy nominations were what's called local area, you know? So when I lived in uh, LA and when I lived in Miami, I did some local stuff that got an Emmy nomination, which means I'm always a bridesmaid, never a bride. But, <laughs> you know, I understand the business well enough, mm -hmm. but the movie and, and streaming business has changed so dramatically in recent decades, if you will, uh, that it's always a learning process. Absolutely. Look, Henry, the very, very best of luck in your production of the reincarnation of Marie. And if people want to find out more about the story, there's a website, mariethestory.com. Very easy to find. And thank you for following your dreams because it inspires so many of us. 
Thank you for having me. And if they're interested in connecting, you know, on MarieTheStory.com, there's also my LinkedIn and Facebook and and there's a background on everything else. If uh, people have more interest, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary.